Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This tape shows the important steps for delivering and adjusting the occlusal bite plane splint. The materials needed for seating the splint and adjusting the occlusion are the Brassler Burr, r and White Fast Cut No. 6 Stone, Rubber Wheel, Articulating Paper, Gauze Squares for Drying the Splint, Explorer, Mirror, and Chim Stock. Examination of the Process Splint. The Process Splint is returned from a laboratory in a plastic bag containing water to which a small amount of preservative or detergent has been added. The bag should be opened on a separate tray so the clean instruments are not contaminated. The splint is cleaned by a water spray and dried with gauze. Examine the inside of the splint carefully. Remove small particles of plaster with an explorer. Both visual examination and finger palpation are useful for locating sharp edges around the border and sharp peaks in the interproximal areas and around the rugae. Using the Brassler acrylic burr or the white fast cut stone, smooth the rough spots before inserting the splint. If the lingual undercuts were blocked out correctly, the splint should fit without need for further adjustment. The splint should be cleared by using a water spray and air after each grinding. Initial insertion. Insert the splint being careful not to pinch the cheek, particularly in the molar area. Check for rocking on the splint by applying pressure diagonally and side to side on the splint. Check for retention by processing on the cuspid rises or tripping on the buccal border. Make sure there is no space between the splint and the teeth. Examine the buccal and palatal tissue for irritation. Splint Centric Adjustment. Dry the occlusal surface of the splint and the occlusal surfaces of the mandibular teeth with gauze. Seat the patient in an upright position and mark the posterior and anterior splint centric contact with articulating paper. Remove the splint. Notice the contacts are very heavy on the right molar region and the left cuspid and first bicuspid area. Lighten the contacts with a Brassler stone. Keep the burr flat with the occlusal surface to avoid dimples. Make sure the splint is inserted properly between each adjustment. Again, use articulating paper to mark the splint-centric contacts. Additional contacts are present on the right side in the cuspid area. Again, lighten the contacts and repeat this procedure until each mandibular tooth is contacting the splint. Additional adjustments have produced bilateral posterior and anterior contacts. Notice that some contacts are larger and therefore contacting heavier than others.
Adjust the heavy contact until the marks are uniform in size. This splint is properly adjusted for even bilateral contacts in splint-centric occlusion. Centric relation adjustment. Recline the patient and check centric relation. Close the patient in centric relation until light contact is made with the splint. Ask the patient to close tightly. The movement demonstrates a slide in centric. The slide must be eliminated. Use a different color articulating paper to mark the contacts in centric relation. The red marks are the splint-centric stops and the blue marks are the centric relation contacts. Lighten the centric relation contacts the same way the splint-centric occlusion contacts were adjusted. A close-up shows the adjustment of the centric relation contacts without changing the splint-centric contacts. Be careful not to grind on the splint-centric contacts. Repeat the procedure of marking and adjusting the centric relation contacts. Notice that most of the mandibular teeth are contacting the splint in centric relation. When the teeth are tapped against the splint, the sound is deeper and louder. For demonstration purposes, the white fast cut stone is used for this adjustment of the centric relation contacts. The acrylic burr or stone should be held distal to the contacts needing adjustment. With the burr in this position, the splint-centric contacts are easily seen as the centric relation contacts are being adjusted. The final adjustment in centric relation produced even contacts bilaterally. Notice how the centric relation contacts are distal to the splint-centric contacts. The small area between the centric relation contacts and the splint-centric contacts should be smooth to develop a freedom of centric. This allows the patient to close between splint-centric and centric relation and maintain even bilateral contacts. Smooth and flatten the splint also to the buccal and lingual border of the splint. Smoothness of non-contact areas is also important because the patients tend to play with rough areas with their tongue and it may be a trigger for bruxism. There should be no indentations on the splint. Finger palpation is useful for locating dimples. Protrusive movement adjustment. Check the splint in protrusion with blue articulating paper. Mark splint centric with red articulating paper. Notice the bilateral protrusive guidance on the cuspid rise. The right side is smooth and the left side is irregular. The guidance on the left side is reduced to produce a smooth guidance. The close-up shows the smooth bilateral guidance 
The protrusive movement is straightforward. The mandible does not jump from side to side or deviate left or right. The posterior teeth disocclude from the splint as do the mandibular incisors. Incisor or posterior contacts will interfere with smooth mandibular protrusive movements. Lateral movement adjustment. Check the lateral excursions from splint-centric and centric relation with blue articulating paper. Notice that the lateral guidance is on the cuspid rises. The right guidance is uneven and therefore smoothed with an acrylic burr. The left guidance is irregular, so the area between the lateral and protrusive guidance is smoothed. The close-up view of the cuspid rise demonstrates continuous lateral guidance from splint-centric. The area between the protrusive guidance and lateral guidance must be flat to provide smooth lateral protrusive movements. The intraoral view shows smooth mandibular movements laterally. Only the cuspid on the working side contacts the splint. The posterior teeth on both the working and balancing sides disocclude during the lateral movement. Incisor or posterior contacts would interfere with smooth lateral movements. Freedom of centric adjustment. The freedom of centric adjustment provides a zone of comfort around splint-centric occlusion and centric relation. Dry the teeth and the splint to obtain good marks with the articulating paper. Place blue paper on both sides of the splint and mark the freedom of centric on both sides of the splint that were waxed into the splint. Have the patient close into splint centric and slide around with all the teeth contacting the splint. The cuspid rise will limit the movement to approximately a half millimeter. Splint-centric is marked with red articulating paper. Observe the marks for small areas of contact around splint-centric. If every tooth does not exhibit such an area, then smooth the heavy contacts with a rubber wheel. Notice the area of freedom for the mandibular cuspid. This area is marked with blue paper. The splint-centric occlusion contact is red. The lateral and protrusive movements are marked in green. The freedom provided for the cuspid does not lock the mandible into only one precise centric position. The intraoral view demonstrates a freedom of movement around splint-centric. The disocclusion would not occur until the cuspids engage the cuspid rises. Splint design. Mark the lip seal with a pencil. Check the splint for excessive bulk on the facial surface. Round the front edge of the splint to the pencil line for lower lip comfort. The facial surface of the cuspid rise should follow the labial surface of the cuspid.
The splint material should not extend more than one millimeter beyond the surface of the maxillary teeth. Eliminate extra bulk from the posterior end of the splint. Smooth the palatal surface and reduce the thick areas by following the contour of the palate and lingual surfaces of the teeth. This reduction is important to provide adequate room for the tongue and normal speech. The facial surface is adjusted to follow the contour of the teeth. This adjustment reduces bulk and sharp edges. The splint must be comfortable for the patient's acceptance. Patients will wear the splint most of the time if it does not interfere with speech or cause gagging. Continue to smooth the sharp edges. Notice how the facial surface follows the contour of the teeth. The proper lip seal adjustment does not interfere with normal speech, nor cause lip strain upon closure. The splint is polished with pumice and Bendix to produce a smooth surface since patients tend to play with rough areas with their tongues. Check the margin of the splint and the palatal tissue for proper location between the rugae and for a good soft tissue seal. Check again after polishing for stability in centric relation. The patient should not slide from centric relation to splint centric occlusion. Mark centric relation and the lateral and protrusive contacts. Polishing may have changed the contacts and further adjustments would be necessary. Also, mark splint-centric occlusion. The finished bite splint. The red marks show even contacts of all the teeth in splint-centric occlusion. The blue marks are centric relation contacts and located slightly distal to each centric occlusion contact. The cuspid has an area of freedom around centric occlusion. The cuspid rise is smooth in protrusive, lateral, and lateral protrusive movements. The area between the red and blue marks is flat, which produces a freedom in centric. The non-functional areas are smooth. Clean the splint with gauze and alcohol. Wet a gauze square and place in a retainer box. The splint can be kept safely in the retainer box when not being worn. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.